Hello. Welcome back to the P Squared Biology Podcast. Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, I thought I was locked in for P Squared Podcast, but it turns out there's already a company called P Squared, and there's already a P Squared Soccer Podcast. So, I guess it's only fitting. P Squared Biology Podcast. So, uh... Yeah, so the main topic will be a paper on sequencing the genome of some great whales, the raw crawls. I don't know how exactly you say that. Goes to show how much of a whale expert I am. Well, probably no more than the average person about animals and whales and ecology and that kind of stuff. Not my specialty. Of course, I graduated with environmental science. I still took biology and a little bit of ecology. So what's new? Uh, this week I started a more rigid diet, only eating up to 2,000 calories. Trying to trim away a few pounds for the summer, um, but nothing too big. Uh, probably I'll t- I'll talk about this later about my YouTube and the progress with that. But, alright, so let's get started. So the title of this paper that was recently published, like a week or two ago, is Whole Genome Sequencing of blue, of the Blue Whales and Other Raw Crawls Find Signatures for Introgressive Gene Flow. And at first I wasn't sure if they meant there were different living species mating with each other, which seems to happen at least a little bit, but... From studying their genome of the the modern great whales, they found that there was definitely gene flow, some species mating with other species of the ancestors of the great whales. Yeah, I'm not too exactly sure how common that is, but it's kind of surprising, I guess. Well, I guess enough that they make that basically the title of their paper, and on Science, Science Daily, where I found this article, that's basically was the main point. So that kind of raises the point, like, what is the purpose of why, you know, whales are pretty smart, much smarter than arguably arguably as smart as us, probably much, much smarter than most animals. Why would they mate with other species besides just assuming that they always want to get it on? Which, you know, humans... Even our own species, when Neanderthals were still alive, we know for sure we made it with some of those. So, do, is it a survival instinct? Is it they were just bored? The paper doesn't really get into that. It more or less just show, tells you the results. But I think it's an interesting question. And I would have loved to see the paper discuss more of the ecology give their ideas a little bit more but it's only fitting that you know they're geneticists they're just showing the information and even just you know it's it's April of 2018 like we're just now sequencing the genome of great whales like you'd think most animals would already have their genes sequenced at least most of them most interesting ones you know there's tons of people care about whales probably more than sharks you know I'm mostly a shark nerd but paper even discussed there's only a few whale species that they sequenced the whole genome which included the mink whales which one of the more common whales I know for sure because I've heard those that's one of the most sustainable whales to harvest the mink whales the bowhead which are not that related to great whales and fin whales yeah, fin whales, that's the second biggest whale, which is related to the, the blue whale. Well, not too close. Apparently, this the SEI whale, I don't know how exactly you say that, is most related to the blue whale. And it kept stating in the paper it had a high degree of heterozygosity. I'm not ex- exactly sure what that means, whether it means it has the most unique genome or... It has the most number of genes, or it's just the most distinct from other whales. But it's definitely it's the arguably the biggest 
animal to ever exist. The only one coming close are the the sauropods, you know, the, like Brontosaurus, but they found huge ones in Argentina that they think would have been larger than blue whales. But that's another story. So another point they brought up was how the gray whales are basically the wild child of the great whales. They actually placed them in a distinct family and genus from the great whales because apparently they're so different from, say, humpback whales, fin whales, and blue whales that they gave them a completely different family, which if you know that much about animal classification, you're basically saying that's a different animal. But apparently the gene... All, all the gene information states it is definitely a great whale and it belongs in the same family even though it's kind of a funny great whale because it's just so adapted to feeding on benthic you know on the sea bottom and vertebrates instead of like the usual krill and other schooling mostly at the surface uh, copepods or isopods or whatever krill is I don't know that much about invertebrates. You'd think I know a bunch from taking biology too. That, of course, is really biased towards invertebrates. But then again, animals in general are mostly invertebrates. But yeah, back on great whales. So, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of how models work with this kind of research. Apparently, they run computer tests that scans the genes, apparently. I mean, studying genes, it seems either super boring or super exciting because I know it's just sequences of lots of letters that they interpret somehow. And, you know, most genes just mean nothing. So it must be a really tedious task. But once you find interesting information, like it was saying how they can study the history of, you know, how the species are related to each other relative abundances over time I don't know how they study that but I mean I'll get into that later but it's just so interesting you know I guess it's only fitting that they know so much about genes and not that much about ecology or not enough to preach about it anyways the models are uh, actually saying there's about a 10% chance that gray whales aren't actually a a great whale (laughs) can you imagine being at a family reunion and there being a 10% chance you're not even related to that family. Which, they don't really mention much. They just kind of mention that in passing. I'm sure it's a great whale. It's only a 10% chance. But just just imagine. <laughs> uh, you're not invited to 10% of the parties. You could not be... <laughs> yeah. We're, we're talking about ancient species. I'm, I'm sure it's much, much easier to study modern individuals. I think most people, they look at whales, they see how big and how rustic they look. I think most people assume that they pretty much were around after the dinosaurs, which is not true. Great whales are a relatively young group. They only diverged from other whales and became their own kind of thing around estimated 10.5 to 7.5 million years ago. Dinosaurs became extinct around 66 or 65 million years ago. That's quite a span. Actually, there were different kinds of whales, not related to modern whales, especially the, well, actually, whales used to be hooved mammals. There used to be no whales. That's, you know, there's a real interesting book called, uh, by the Wisen about the evolution and how we know that whales definitely evolved from land animals and finding all those really quality fossils over in Pakistan I were pretty fortunate to be able to dig up around the 70s to 90s with all those tr- transitional whales. Uh, but that's another story. But yeah, so the great whales have only been around for about 10 or so million years ago. 10 or so million years. Which is around the time period of the Miocene. That's the age of most. If you dig up a, a Florida megalodon, Chances are it was around when the first great whales were around. You know, and there's a reason for that because there was a lot of nutrients from, because there were new currents in the water and these have names. I forget the exact names of them. I read this in a Prothero book after the dinosaurs. That's the name of the book. 
how there was a lot of cold, big currents with cold water rushing up in the temperate and polar zones. And all those bringing a lot of nutrients from the bottom to the surface. And what that does, it allows plankton to really diversify, become super common, and then other life thrive off of that plankton. Especially whales, because they eat little invertebrates, which eat that plankton, and or photosynthesize, I'm sure. So, basically, you don't see huge sharks around the poles. Well, not that many. You know, you got the sluggish Greenland shark, because, you know, they're they're cold-blooded for the most part. They, they can't sustain an active lifestyle for being that cold-blooded. And just the way their circulatory system works is not too efficient in cold water like the warm blooded whales are. Which I'm sure their huge size is probably in part due to just the abundance of krill and all that stuff. You know, they can pretty much get as big as they want and not, they didn't have any many predators. I mean, I guess that's debatable whether predators. You know, keep kind of keep other animal size in check because you look at you know you still had predatory dinosaurs when the sauropods became huge when glyptodons became huge you know they pretty much had scoots protect protective armor but there's so many big animals that don't have armor that you'd think if that hypothesis was true they would not grow as huge as they are giraffes elephants but also keeping warm is a big factor you don't see many small whales in the poles because they would freeze to death. And you, you don't really think about that watching those nature documentaries from the comfort of your house. But you have to imagine those polar waters are super cold. You don't see a tiger shark or a great white shark just coming up and snapping a penguin. You know, you just see some uh, hot-blooded end endothermic birds and mammals for the most part. And don't get me wrong, there were some sharks and dinosaurs and all that stuff at the poles at one point but that was when the earth was much much warmer we're currently living in pretty much uh, an icy planet you know of course it's still warm around the equator and subtropical zones but that's pretty much always an exception there's never been ice ages around florida which is why you don't have super ancient rocks and you're finding megalodon teeth that are not too too ancient but anyways i'm getting sidetracked so around the Pliocene, Pleistocene, around around 5 million years ago, the states, the blue, the fin, and the humpback whales were much, they're much more abundant than they are now. And, you know, again, I don't know how they figure this from just looking at a genome, looking at their ancestral genes. Maybe they just find some similarities or something really successful that is, seems ancient. I don't know how exactly they pinpoint that. You know, if you know, definitely let me know, because I'm really curious. And I, I found this really surprising. Apparently, blue whales maintained a larger population size than any other whale, or at least great whales. But they didn't decline until around 400,000 years ago. And that was a pretty steady decline, apparently. And, you know, we almost made them extinct around the 1980s. Which kind of sucks, but apparently they're now they're rebounding, which is really great. You know how depressing would that be? We made the hugest animal to ever exist become extinct, but they're recovering slowly but surely. You know they can only reproduce so quickly and so much. Kind of like humans, and sharks are the same way. We need to protect sharks. You you just you, you know I I have to always include something about sharks talking about oceanic marine animals. That's just a given. Oh, actually, I made an error there. They said the Pliocene, Pleistocene boundary, they were much more abundant. But they didn't account for, they recently reclassified the start of the Pliocene to 5 million years ago. Wait, they did, this is something to move around. But the paper says they were definitely more abundant around 2.6 million years ago. Which is arguably the end of the Pleistocene. The end of the Pliocene start of Pleistocene. That's what I thought it was. Apparently it's calling it the... Oh wait, that was... Yeah, that was the end of the Pliocene. My bad. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it goes to show how much I know about the Pliocene Pleistocene. I mostly study the Miocene and Snaggletooth and but this stuff really interesting it really interests me too, some parts about it. And in the paper they had one small diagram. I think they should have made it larger. Uh kind of depicting the gene flow between the species or the ancestral species. And it's really complex and uh really interesting. I mean I don't know how exactly to describe it. It looks like the ancestor of the Psi whale and the blue whale had the most gene flow with the other groups. And even they interacted with the mink whale a little bit. Some gene flow there. Or the ancestors of the mink whale, which looks like is nested right outside of the great whales. I don't think they grow that large. Uh, let me double check. Mink whale size. Oh, 35 feet. That's that's pretty large. But, you know, during the Miocene, when there were a bunch of sharks and really a lot of upwelling and the earth was super warm, you know, you didn't have... You still had some giant predatory whales, but no giant fil filter feeders as far as I know. It was mostly the Cetothere whales that only grew up to about 25 feet, maybe 30 feet. Yeah, I think around 20 to 25 feet was pretty much the max. And it wasn't until the emergence of the modern great whales around 10 million years ago, or I guess 10 to 7, that they really became huge. Or started to, I guess. I don't know how exactly how big their ancestors were. But even though there's gene flow, which it seems kind of contradictory that they kind of had some gene flow, yet they made distinct groups. And they keep calling it sympatric speciation. You know, they diverged into different different groups, even though there are no geographical barriers. But how do you know that for sure? You can't. I I feel like you can't always just assume that the ocean is just one big connected thing. What if there were different currents that kind of separated them a little bit? I don't. I'm not buying it too much, but. But apparently uh, there's some patchwork speciation going on in orcas right now. So, you know, orcas may, might become different species because they're feeding different groups, feeding on different kinds of animals. And I think that's pretty much how speciation occurs. You know, you have one ancestral species and then as they feed on different kinds of things, they don't interact with those other individuals. They start through natural selection. It starts favoring favorable conditions or favorable characteristics on feeding on that one type of prey or one type of lifestyle that they become something else but again that's another story it tries to justify it so bad how you know it, it makes sense that they thought gray whales were not gray whales were not great whales it says because gray whales are morphologically behaviorally and eco and ecologically distinct from other great whales, I don't know how to say the jargon, Balaenoterid, placing them in a separate family, starts with an E, distinct from the great whales, sensu stricto, seemed natural. And then, of course, they go on to say, oh, we, my bad, we were wrong. You know, silly me, for th these whales are completely different. You'd think they're just they're not a great whale but apparently they are I like cases like this where they study the genes and they find out something is actually related to something else I think the okapi I'm pretty sure is related to giraffes even though they look pretty different actually I know for sure the closest living relative of whales that aren't whales are hippos yeah like how do you figure that but it says it even says in the paper the uh, hippos diverged from other the main that hooved herbivore group is called artiodactyls they diverged into their own little group around 50 million years ago i think it said like 53 i don't know for sure that you know the exact numbers it's guesswork i don't know how exactly they get to that and of course the closest living relatives of manatees and dugongs are elephants which you know I don't remember when exactly they diverged from the Probitians. Probos. It starts with the P, the elephant group. And 
I'd like to find papers like this that have so many so in-depth details of when exactly some groups diverge from other groups like it it estimated that orcas and bottlenose dar dolphins diverged around 8 million years ago and I like to find this kind of data from for sharks like especially snaggletooths I like to know when snaggletooths becomes became their own thing which I know it had to have been pretty early on because they're not that related to to many other sharks they belong in the weasel shark family mostly small up to like four or five feet even though the modern snaggletooth grows up to like seven or eight feet yeah it's in a chart right here or toward the bottom of the paper and it has a hippo on the the chart even though it's mostly about whales it states it basically shows the great whales diverged around 10.5 million years ago i guess that's the conservative estimate but Maybe that's the more accurate. Maybe it's closer to 10 than 7, or maybe they're just making a conservative estimate. Actually, I think it'd be more conservative to be guessing it diverged later in time. I don't know, man. <laughs> there's, there's so much I don't know. For as much information as it brings up, I think it brings up more questions, at least in my mind. But it's still a very entertaining, informative paper. Especially... I basically knew this, but it's good to see it in writing in an official paper that the tooth whales and the modern baleen whales, you know, of course you had ancient tooth whales called the archaeochetes that lived in the Eocene. They became extinct around 30 or 40 million years ago, but the modern whales didn't evolve until more recently, like, yeah, when the Oligocene started around... 30 million years ago yeah because the Eocene ended around 33 basically the Archaeocene went extinct and then the modern baleen and the modern tooth whales basically took over or started to but you had the same shark groups though <laughs> it goes to show how successful sharks are a lot of the same species of course those probably are more generalists they probably less specialized they don't have to eat as much if you really think about who survives and who goes extinct, there's a lot of underlying reasons, and sometimes we don't know for sure, but <laughs> that that belongs in a separate extinction talk. So not only did it talk about the ancient great whale ancestors basically mating with each other, having some gene flow. Yeah, they, they knew how to go with the flow. <laughs> That's why they had that gene flow. Oh, okay. So it... It discussed a little bit about modern reports of great whales basically mating with other species, which include blue and fin whales, humpback plus blue whales, and bowhead plus right whales. Which bowhead and right whales, they belong in a different group of baleen whales. I don't know if it has an official name. Again, I don't know too much about whales. That's, that's two examples, two known examples of modern great whales making hybrids. Of course, they're not the only ones, you know, with the canines, the basically the dogs or the wolves. I've heard most of them can mate with each other, except I think there's one main exception. This is just going from what I heard on a, a different podcast. I think it's the jackals that basically the odd man out that can't mate with most other canines. Even like lions and tigers, they can mate with each other. Make some ligers. And again, you had uh, Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens neanderthalus. Or, because you know there are many different, or at least several different human species. I don't know for sure why we are the only living human species. Actually, I, I think I've heard that Neanderthals were actually smarter than us. They had bigger brains. But for some reason, maybe they're too specialized. Again, I don't know. So I just found an article from a few years back, 2012, feels like a few years back, time passes so fast, that apparently the common and the Australian black tip are hybridizing. Basically, you don't hear about sharks becoming hybrids that often, but I'm sure it happens with closely related groups. I think tiger sharks are kind of, they don't have any relatives. There used to be more species of those. They're a really ancient group, you know. I, I really love that they're still around, that 
most people take this for granted and probably wish that we didn't have tiger sharks because they eat humans. But they are a super interesting, unique, adaptable group. And I'm sure even Bethany Hamilton, you know, she doesn't hold too much of a grudge. Or she apparently doesn't because she still surfs, but, you know. It's like people are so selfish and they only care about how animals relate to them. I think they need to understand the big picture and be more, what's the word, thankful that we have some unique species still with us. You know, mo over 99.9% .9 of species are extinct. But yeah, for as much as I'd like, I'd love to find a paper like this about sharks and their ancestral DNA. I'm really glad there's people, passionate people still out there studying these unique marine animals. You know, there's so many people probably wondering, oh, why are we funding so many research on animals? But I think we can really learn from them and predict the future based on the past, especially in cases like this. But about my YouTube channel, Dman9FP, you're supposed to be like Demand. I'm Demand. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to really soon record my next, well, I, I recorded over half of it having to do with my second Melton match, which went pretty smooth overall, but then my most epic match versus Robinson, arguably my most epic match, especially a second set tiebreak. I'll get go into detail about that pretty back and forth, but you already know if, if you look in the information about the general results of that season in 2011, playing in high school, you can pretty much assume who won that match. <laughs> but it's it's a fun thing to think about, you know, how I can learn from it and what it tells me about myself. You know, I, I don't love living in the past, which is why I re record fun little things like this and not just talking about the good old days. But I think... You have to make every moment basically justify it as the good old days in some respect. Otherwise, you're not really living, in my opinion. And you can disagree with that, but I think you just have to make every day special somehow. Uh, what else? Uh, P Squared, the podcast name, or P Squared Biology, that has to do with my real name. It was a nickname given to me by one kind of unique person eccentric <laughs> that as far as I know not many people call me that anymore but I wouldn't mind if you just want to say hey P squared actually my full initials are PCP but I think making this the PCP podcast that that's kind of much but yeah if you guys have any any questions let me know uh, like comment subscribe spread the word of this new podcast if you have a, a paper it can be recent, like this paper, or an old paper. You want me to check out, see if I find it interesting enough. It doesn't ha just have to be vertebrates. I love vertebrates, especially marine ones, but say you find a really interesting paper on dinosaurs, or sea urchins, or I don't know, bony fish. You know, I'll at least check it out, let, let you know what I think about it. Yeah, this, this is fun. I think I might have to make another podcast sometime. Probably the editing of this won't be as fun, but... Uh, comes with the territory, I guess. Hopefully I can make it s smooth. I know I kind of detracted from my main points sometimes. I hope I didn't make it seem too much like a lecture. But again, I'm open to any and all criticism. I think I'll just put this on my uh, YouTube for now. Maybe I'll put this on iTunes. People online suggesting you put your podcast on iTunes or else you're nobody. I'm like, who, who still uses iTunes? Like... Are we done using iPods? It's 2018, but maybe that's the way to go with podcasts. I don't know. All right, well, so I'll see you. Yep.